Business Connections Live, the UK's leading online business channel. Connections Live with Steve Highland. Hello there, welcome along. This is Business Connections Live, the program for entrepreneurs, SMEs and business owners. Now, on today's show, we're going to be talking about the need for consent when collecting personal data for marketing. Why are we talking about it? Well, we're talking about it because it's all part of the incoming regulations, GDPR, something that everybody seems to be talking about. Uh, but there is a lot of confusion out there. There's a lot of people telling, well, maybe not half-truths. Perhaps that's just a little bit too strong, but they are... It does seem joining a gold rush at the moment to get out there to see if they can make more money out of it by maybe frightening us normal folk into thinking that GDPR is something that's going to be very difficult. It's going to be um, hard to implement. And if we don't do it, we're going to get heavily fined. Is that going to be really the case? Joining me in the studio today is Linda Bazant. She's a GDPR lawyer and consultant and also part of Business Connections Live. So it's great to have Linda in the studio today. Thank you very much. It makes a real change, actually. It's a real pleasure to have you sitting in the hot seat. I know we've said this before and we've done programmes on this before between us, but let's just talk a little bit about GDPR. For those people that know absolutely nothing about it, what does it stand for and what's it all about? At the moment, we have the Data Protection Act, and so we've actually been having to comply with data protection now for just about 20 years. But of course, technology has moved on with the internet and cybersecurity and so on. So everything has been improved and updated, and it's now going to be called the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR for short, which will become law on the 25th of May, 2018. And that means that there is an awful lot more that companies have to do to comply with the new regulation to make absolutely certain that they are squeaky clean. Now, is this something that is completely brand new? I mean, you said there that we've had data protection. So is it is it just a leap of faith, really, that we're going so far away from where we are with, with data protection at the moment? Or is it or is it an increment to that? It's an increment to that, and the reason why it's being introduced is that so many of us now are freely giving our data online for anything that we're ordering, uh, anything that we're talking about on the telephone and so on, and people are starting to say, hang on a second, I'm giving out an awful lot of my personal information. Is that entirely necessary? And also the other issue is I don't trust the people that I'm giving my information to, but I'm being put in a position where unless I give them that information, I can't go any further with the transaction. And so the General Data Protection Regulation is recognising that and actually giving the data protection individual a little bit more teeth. So you can actually say, I don't want to give you that information. You can say, um, I would like you to stop sending me information. I'd like you to delete my information. I thought we could do that now. Well, you can, but the trouble is that it's, it's being suppressed. And then every so often, people will actually go back to the suppression file and they'll, they'll just email you again just to make absolutely certain that you were really certain that you wanted to be suppressed now. So is, is the data protection that we've got at the moment, is it, while it seems to be adequate, is it... Is it nearly toothless? I would say it's not toothless, but is it? Does it? It just doesn't seem to have the path for all these. There are a number of people who do internet marketing. They collect lists. I was at a meeting the other day, and somebody said that they scrape websites for um, for contact details. I mean, th this is what we're, they're trying to get rid of, isn't it? You're not going to be able to do that. No. You're. Your list has got to be uh, got to have a lot more integrity about it. It's got to have the unambiguous consent of the person whose data that you are using to market to them. And with regard to teeth, at the moment, the top fine that the Information Commissioner's Office can um, can fine you with is five hundred thousand pounds for a breach. From the twenty fifth of May, it will be seventeen million pounds for a breach. However. I don't, want everyone to, I don't want everyone to panic, 
because we're not, they're not saying for every single breach we'll find you 17 million. Obviously they'll have the same uh, reaction to each and every breach that they will um, obviously look at themselves. So and these are the scare tactics uh, that people who are going out and talking yes, about GDPR are. are actually using, isn't it? Yeah. So d in your opinion then, do you think that what we'll see is that we'll see a fine where applicable that will be measurable against what the offence is. That's so exactly if somebody it. somebody gets a bit wrong, they'll be they'll be told you shouldn't have done that. Uh, if they're a large multinational organisation that should know better, they're the ones that will be hung out to dry. Ish. Yes. Uh, how, I mean, the large multinational organisations should should already be doing something. They should actually hard, have already yeah. done it. But there are an awful lot of businesses that are looking at it and, and thinking, well. I, I probably won't bother. I, I might just leave it. You have seven months to comply. And on the 25th of May, the Information Commissioner's Office will be looking at everybody, not just big organisations, but smaller ones as well, to make sure that we all comply. So what they're going to be saying is if there is a breach and if there is a complaint to the Information Commissioner's Office, they will investigate that. But if you as a business can say, look, over the past few months we've done everything we possibly can to comply with GDPR, we've got our um, manuals in place, we've trained all of our staff, our staff do understand the principles of GDPR, but in this case we got it a bit wrong. If you can prove to the Information Commissioner's Office that you've made the effort then they would probably just say to you, you need to put that right. But if you don't put it right, and if you keep getting the same thing wrong, then you will get that fine. Are the ICO ready, do you think, the Information Commissioner's Office? Uh, I think it's Are very... They, have they got a bit of a battle on their hands to be ready in time? They've got a battle on their hands in as much as, because this is something that's coming out of Europe, and we still have to abide by it because, of course, we don't leave Europe until 2019 and this becomes law in 2018. They are still looking at different areas that are coming out of Europe with regard to exactly what's going to be happening come May. And it's there. They have a working party. It's called the Article 29 Working Party. So they're all working on it to make absolutely certain that by the time May comes, we know exactly what all of the other states are going to be doing so that we can comply. But having said that, there is no reason why you can't go to the Information Commissioner's website right now for all of the information that you need to comply with the new pr uh, protection regulation. And of course, as I said, you've already got data protection. You should already be complying with data protection. What you need to do now is find out exactly what the additions are to data protection to make sure that you comply. So you're not starting from scratch. You are tweaking what you already have. Well, I hope that feels a little bit more reassuring to you that we are, as Linda says, you are just tweaking what you've already got implemented within your business at the moment. Um, you may have noticed, though, in your email inboxes, there are a lot of businesses out there who are selling lists. We live in a world of vanity. I often say it on the programme where everybody thinks that a, a, a list of 20,000 people is going to be better than a list of 10,000 people. Actually, what you're looking for are people who, A, want to receive the information that you're talking about, and B, actually want to do business with you. Surely that's what you're looking for. And if you only had 100 people on your list that were doing that, that would be a more valuable list than a thousand people who do none of that. So, you know, you've got to be very, very conscious, I think, and very aware of that. As I said, you're probably seeing in your inbox at the moment there are organisations who are trying to sell you lists. What should we be aware of when it comes to those people then? With regard to people that are selling you lists, it is also, they also have to make absolutely certain that the people on those lists have given you... The, their unambiguous consent to be contacted for marketing and also for the type of marketing that they're going to be receiving. And there are some list companies who are just harvest, harvesting information and selling it on to people just uh, and saying that yes, they do have consent when they don't. And, and just by way of illustration, uh, some recent finds uh, in February, ICO investigation found the data supply company had sold more than 580,000 records containing people's details, which resulted in 21,000 spam texts being sent by the firm who bought the information. So the problem there, of course, is the 
firm that bought the information bought can it in say, good faith. we bought it in good faith. However, you have got to make absolutely certain when you buy these things off of people that they have indeed got unambiguous consent and that they can actually prove it because otherwise you're kind of going to get yourself in as much hot water as, a, as the list company that sold you the list. At what point does the responsibility drop off the person who's buying the list's uh, shoulders? So if I go to a company and I say, do you have um, permission for me to send to these people? Uh, and, and also the fact that it's specific as well. So can I market to these people or sell to these people? I can be somewhat ambiguous in, in what I'm asking to do with the list of these companies. What should the companies be saying back to me? Uh, what you would need to do is, if you're buying a list from a company, you need to make sure that they've got the appropriate consent. And one way that you can do that is to actually put in place a contract with them that says, I will buy your list, however, in compliance with the General Data Protection Regulation, I must have an assurance from you that you have followed all of the rules and regulations and that the list that you are giving me is a list of people that actually want to hear from a company like mine and that they have given you that consent. So if you have a, an agreement in place, if there is ever anything down the line that comes back and says, well, actually, we didn't give consent to the list company, then if the information commissioner comes after you as the buyer of the list, you can say, look, we did everything reasonably practicable to make absolutely certain the list that we were buying was a bona fide list, and here's the agreement we have in place where we were assured that the company we were buying it from had that appropriate consent. So if you are receiving those emails at the moment in your emails, uh, in your inbox rather, and you're thinking to yourself, actually, it seems like a really good opportunity to increase my mailing list and get out of there, be cautious about this. Make certain you put in place all the right um, procedures within your own organisation. I love the idea of actually being nearly able to ensure against uh, that you're going to be liable for this. So once again, a really good piece of advice there. If you don't watch any more of the programme, just be thinking about that just for a moment. We're talking GDPR. My guest on today's show is Linda Bazant, lawyer and consultant specialising in a GDPR. You're watching Business Connections Live. It's great to have your company today. This really is a very hot topic at the moment. A lot of people are talking about it. Uh, and there seems to be a lot of people out there that are getting, as I said earlier on, just half truth. They don't really know the full ramifications of what GDPR will mean. And as Linda's already explained, it really is no more than just an extension to the existing data protection. I suppose you could look at it in a, in a way that data protection is now catching up with the technology that is out there and the ways that we communicate, the ways that we market and the ways that we sell to individuals and to third parties and other companies. And uh, maybe that's what GDPR is all about. But the one thing I would love to come out of this is a reduction of the junk mail that I receive. Uh, and if that is... If that's what this achieves, then I'm standing right behind this and, and waving the flags and playing the band. Absolutely fantastic. We will find out a little bit if, about the jurisdiction of where they actually originate for as well. We'll be looking at that a little bit later on as the program progresses. All right, let's go back a week then, shall we? Let's look at what we talked about last week. Does your company have an HR department, human resources? Do you have somebody within your organisation that sits down and works out what your employment, uh, your employee's contract is actually is going to be? What their terms of their job are? What they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing? What's expected from them? How do you discipline people within your organisation? How do you dismiss people? Are you in a position within your organisation to do that? Well, last week we had a really great programme. Martine Robbins, she joined us on uh, the programme. She's from the HR department uh, in Woking, uh, HR Dept, D-E-P-T. Uh, she came into the studio to talk about everything that SMEs, just like you and me, need to find out when it comes to having an HR department. And just to give you a bit of an insight of what we talked about, here are the highlights from last week's edition of Business Connections Live. <music> Thank you.
You're watching Business Connections Live. It's great to have you with us today. We're talking all things HR today from the HR department working. Uh, we've got Martine Robbins, she's the owner of that. This is a franchise actually, isn't it? So there's a it number is. of you up and down the country, but you deal predominantly with com uh, companies down here in the southeast yes. of, of the country. So basically you work between the employer and the employees, making sure that messages, communication gets actioned and, and actioned in a very clear and under easy understandable way. Primarily I work with small and medium sized businesses now um, and there is a real need for those organisations to engage with an HR person. But I think again it's about communication so if you're working with a business owner it is going in and agreeing with that business owner what, what the, the plan is, what the ground rules are. Well typically I, I'll get a call because somebody is facing a problem uh, and often it's a problem with an employee so often that position is coming from a panic organization, yeah, situation in the organisation so the the idea is to go in and work with them and take away the pain. I think working with um, SME businesses, that often isn't an issue. Um, it is in a bigger corporate environment be um, because you know that's just the way it is. It's you know a bigger organisation and you get lots of different people coming into play. With um, smaller, medium-sized businesses, typically you are engaging with that business owner. I would probably say in my short period of time as being uh, a business owner, then I would probably come across probably between 70 and 80 people. 80% of businesses don't have that don't. documentation. No, no. Um, and I came across one potential client that has been trading for 10 years. With Without any employment contracts, I think you know the war for talent. Even though that's a bit of a cliche, um, is very real. Uh, if you look in and around, certainly the, the Woking and Greater Surrey area, you're looking at between 85 and 90 percent full employment at the moment. So there's lots of uncertainty, as we know, with Brexit on the horizon, and employers are already finding lots of opportunities on the lots horizon. Lots of opportunity as well. There's, there's yeah, no, I am, I am sort of you know positive about the fact that there will be lots of opportunity. But at this point in time, employers are still struggling to mm. find people to come in and help them grow their businesses. So get those basics on board um, and once someone comes into the organisation, really engage them, um, understand what makes them tick, sit down and have a chat with them, have the little brown bag lunch events that they talk about in the a, States. A brown bag lunch? Yeah, so I've never heard yeah, that you, know, you, you just sit around, you know, go and get a takeaway at lunchtime, talk about what the business is trying to achieve in a very informal but easy to understand way. It's important to understand, again, what the business owner is trying to achieve in their organisation. And really I see HR and certainly what I do as being a conduit and a facilitator for that. I think as a, as a starting point, when a business is small and they're trying to get some traction, then I think it's a good solution to sort of help them on their way, say dealing with the compliance and keeping them on the straight and narrow and just helping them be guided in the right way. So again, it's trying to make sure that we are working with organisations to sort of keep them on the straight and narrow. That's, that's really what it needs to be, okay? I want to sort of make sure that my clients are actually focusing on what's important to their business, which is typically developing a sustainable, profitable business. I would ask about their background um, and what they can bring to your business, because at the end of the day, you want to engage with someone that is going to give you access to lots of different resources, information, skills, skill and knowledge. So be confident that the person that you're talking to about providing that has the credentials that you're looking for. I think it's trying to understand how I can help them really. It, it is that sort of clear. Um, you know, a business owner has to be very clear what they're going to get from the transaction. Um, and if they haven't worked with an HR provider previously, they may have a preconceived view, um, which may or may not be accurate. So I think it's important that they are open and honest. I'm Martin Robbins from the HR department, we, Woking. We provide outsourced HR support, primarily for small and medium-sized businesses, helping them find pragmatic and practical solutions to employing people. If you're taking that first step in trying to find the right person for your organisation or you're growing and you need the process to help you function more effectively going forward, working with someone like me can help you bring that process into play and also make sure that you are compliant as well as focusing on the best practice aspects. So for all the help that you need on HR, call me, Martin Robbins, HR Department, Preventing People Problems.
Martin Robbins, a great programme there as well. If you are thinking about um, having an HR function within your business, I think uh, it should be well worth talking to, to be honest with you. Fascinating lady. Really enjoyed her company on last week's edition of the programme. And by the way, if you're thinking to yourself, hey, this is a great way of getting information out to maybe my customers and you don't want to spam them, you actually want to give them something that is of value out there, then, well, why don't you contemplate having a programme like this one? If you're sending out a newsletter at the moment, it is all too easy for your newsletter to be dull and boring. Turn your readers into viewers. That's what you need to be doing. You could have a branded show just like this one simply by contacting us here at Business Connections Live. It's that easy to do that. Drop us an email to this address. It is studio at businessconnectionslive.com. There you go. Or if you wish, you can also pick up the, fo the dog and bone, the phone, and give us a call on 01784 256 777. How about following our stream of consciousness as well? Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at BCL Business TV. Uh, you can also watch the programmes every week at midday on a Monday on Facebook. You can leave comments there as well, please, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. But probably the best place to go for over 250 hours of great free business advice is to our website at businessconnectionslive.com. Just go there. You're going to get all sorts of great information. And you'll also see the different services that we as a business provide. Businesses just like yours who are trying to get their message out there. Everything from production all the way through the training, particularly media training as well. If you want to handle yourself in front of uh, TV and radio, then we'll show you the best way to go about doing it. Uh, simply go to the website, businessconnectorslive.com. You're watching Business Connections Live. Lovely to have your company with us uh, today. Joining me in the studio is GDPR lawyer and consultant Linda Bazan. We were talking, Linda, about lists just a few moments ago and what we should be aware of when it comes to purchasing the list. The, the one question I was going to ask you about that, have they sorted out this whole area of jurisdiction, where the list is coming from, who owns it, what laws it, it comes under? Obviously, if it's within in Europe, we've got the whole European thing that we're going to be, but America is a place where a lot of people hold onto their list. Is it, once again, do you have to just still be aware? Is it where you're using the list that's important? You still have to be aware. Wherever that list is coming from, you need to make absolutely certain with regard to the UK that you are compliant with the General Data Protection Regulation and that you have the appropriate consent. Now, one of the big bugbears that people have these days are nuisance calls. Yes. Can't stand them. You don't get very many of them because no. you've done you've done things to stop that. I have. I still get loads of them. Right. Well, let's... And, and they seem to be changing as well now. There seems to be they're using auto IVR systems that have got automated voices on them. Hi, my name's Cindy. I understand you've been in a road accident. You're getting all this kind of stuff, and these are automated voice recognition type systems. It's really getting very sophisticated. So a lot of money has been invested in that side to create these new calls. What can we do about that? And should it stop? Yes, it should stop. Uh, another reason for GDPR. But at the moment, you already have redress. You can register your telephone number with the telephone preference service. Now, does that, does that work? TPS. Um, actually, yes, it does. Um, just so that you know, the Information and Commissioner's Office has reminded companies making direct marketing calls that people registered with TPS are off limits. So Laura Anderson Limited broke the law when they called people who were registered with the TPS and they were fined appropriately. Now remember, the fines go up in May. So that should protect us even more. But you have the telephone preference service. And another question I get asked is, what about business to business? There is also a corporate telephone preference service if businesses want to register. Really? There is a fax preference service and there is a mail preference service for posting. But, so, but there is a danger that if you go down that route, I can see on a personal level, but no business is an island and, and surely businesses... I might have the, the greatest mousetrap in the whole world and it's going to be absolutely suitable for my client over here, but he doesn't know about it because I haven't been able to tell him because, you know, should be able to still market to him. Is it not becoming sales prevention a wee bit? But that's down to the business. If the business choose to, ref to um, register with the 
uh, corporate telephone preference service, then they're perfectly entitled to do so. And it may well be that they are getting inundated with cold calling, which is stopping them from actually doing their business. You see, it, it is contradictory, isn't it, to what business is all about. People talk about cold calling as particularly with the fact that we've got so much spam out there at the mm. moment, so much email traffic going on, people are now actually seeing the cold call. We've had Antonio Falco on the programme a few weeks back, and he's saying, you know, pick up the phone and call. You look at many of our guests who are talking about sales, direct sales technique, they are saying, pick up the phone and call. So here we're looking at the an active way to generate sales, but by companies registering for this, it becomes a passive. They, they, they have to go doing the looking for the brands or the products that they want to purchase from. Yes, that's true. Generally speaking, most corporate companies will accept calls. And of course, they always have the gatekeeper that you have to go through that may pass the call on or may not do. But the telephone preference service is looking at individuals, but also sole traders and partnerships because they're not limited companies. They are individual people. And what marketing companies are being told to do is that they must check any telephone number that they have with the telephone preference service before they start phoning. And if that person is on there that says, I do not want to hear from you, you must not phone them. There's no reason to, to be phoning them. And, and there is absolutely no reason at all. If, if I register with this, and is it difficult to do? No, it's very easy. You can just go online to the telephone preference service. It's free. You just go online and you register your number. It may take about 28 days for it to filter through, but within 28 days you shouldn't receive most spam calls. Now the problem that you've got, of course, is that there are, there are some companies that just completely ignore the law and will phone you anyway. They don't check the telephone preference service. And uh, a couple of them here, uh, Liverpool firm find uh, that made more than 100,000 nuisance calls fined £70,000 in October. In May, a company behind 99.5 million nuisance calls was fined £400,000 by the Information Commissioner's Office. Now, you also mentioned to me automated marketing calls. They are slightly different. With automated marketing calls, the only reason that you can make those calls is if you have unambiguous consent. And it's got nothing to do with the telephone preference service. They're not saying, if you check the telephone preference service and you can't find that number on there for people saying, I don't want to hear from you, you can do an automated call. You can't. That's got nothing to do with it. You can only do an automated call if you have unambiguous consent from that person to say, yes, I will accept your call. So what about the problem that we all seem to fall into? Because you know I'm a sucker for this because I, mm, I, I like to waste their time. I, I will play a, a bit of a dance with them. So if somebody phones me up and says, have you had a car accident recently? I go... Oh, yes, I have. And I continue on the conversation, which is interesting because the moment you do that, they then take you on to somewhere else. Now, what I've found, though, if you at that point say, no, I haven't, I don't want to talk to you ever again, get off my phone, goodbye, they put the phone down on you. And if you try to re-ring the number, yes. what will what the message you invariably get is you have received a marketing call. And so you get no further details. You can't phone back on that number to get through to anybody to say, remove this. I do also ask them to remove me from the list for all the good that's probably doing. They're probably just sticking the phone down, aren't they? Yeah. So what, what do I do in that case then? Do I, do I just block it on my phone until I get another number that I'm on? Or is there a way that I can report that number? If you get that kind of a call, under the Data Protection Act now and GDPR, any company that calls you have got to tell you who they are and give you a contact number that you can contact them with. And I know that there are some that don't do that. All but of if them you, don't. But if you're getting phone calls through and you're getting a number and you are asking them not to call you and to take you off the list and then you find that they call you again or they call you via a different number, you can complain to the Information Commissioner's Office and give them that number and they can investigate. Fantastic. So, for example, automated calls, uh, 19th of September, um, a Coventry firm fined 260,000 calls for making 16.7 million automated marketing calls illegally. I mean, we are talking about a huge number of calls here that are coming through, a, a huge number, the correspondence levels. Do these companies, do they care?
because if they're looking, if they're looking at, should we say, doing a quarter of a million uh, calls, and they get, and should we say, ten percent of them, they actually get some form of response to, are they making more money than the fine will be? So therefore, it is still in their favour to just ignore the law and to continue doing what they're doing. Well, yes, they can do, and the uh, fine that I just mentioned to you, the two hundred thousand pounds, in May goes up to 17 million. So yes, they can, ha they can have fines at the moment, and yes, they made 16.17 million automated marketing calls, and in their balance sheet, maybe it was worth the fine. But come next May, if they keep doing it, that is a very serious breach, and they will get fined an enormous amount of money for it, which means it isn't worth doing it anymore. The, the BBC, God love them, in their infinite wisdom, that they are not people that do cold calling, but they did have an article on their website that said, um, will, will GDPR bankrupt small businesses, small companies? People that are doing this kind of stuff, I, I understand what you're saying, because we, we talk from the legitimate side of trying to control this. But the company that is doing that kind of number of cold calling and is using that for, a, for marketing purposes, is it not just as easy for them to have a holding company and then another limited company under it? And that limited company is the one that is represented and is the one that goes down. So it's nearly a shell company that is doing the calling. Yes. And so we're, we're really, you know, they're just hiding behind limited companies. But hence, again, the reason for going to the Information Commissioner's Office and allowing them to do all of the appropriate investigations to drill down into who all of these businesses are. That's telephony. Let's talk a little bit about emails then, shall we? We'll, we'll go down that route. Do we have the same, the same power, the same kind of things that we can do when it comes to emails? Can we... Um, you know, I can't believe it. I'm going to say the company's name as well, British Gas. I received a document from them. They were asking me for a meter reading from a company called Morrison's Data. I've never heard of Morrison's Data. Don't know who the heck they are. Apparently, they represent British Gas when it comes to metering. I have smart meters, by the way. So why they want a meter reading is absolutely beyond me. So on this document, the, the final sign-off actually says that all calls are monitored for training purposes. And on that document, there is no clear way except to send, fill the form in and send it back to contact that company. There is no telephone number. There is a PO box number. That to me is the same as going to a website where there are no contact details, just a PO box number. It doesn't tell me physically where this company that represents one of the largest energy companies in the UK, I can't contact them. It's just, it is truly disgraceful. They are supposed to be to give you the contact details so that you can contact them if that's what they're doing. Of course, with regard to the email that you're getting for your um, meter reading, that could be could come under legitimate business interest rather than consent. So they are contacting you for a legitimate business reason because they provide gas to you and they are asking you for a meter reading. They're, yeah, not, this is snail they're mail. not selling you anything. This is snail mail. So there was no contact details on a, on a piece no, of but snail there should, mail? No, there should have been there should have been contact details. That That's unacceptable. And uh, I can only advise you to go to directly to British Gas and complain to them about the way that they're handling that particular side of their business. Mumble, grumble, grumble, mumble. Exactly. Listen, more to talk about on this. We're going to get right into the whole, um, the thick of it when it comes to email documentation as well and what you do receive. Also, unsubscribing. And when you unsubscribe, what really should be happening to people that unsubscribe from this? We'll be finding out more in a few moments' time with Linda Bazant, GDPR lawyer and consultant. Right, as I step down now from my soapbox, it does annoy me, actually. I think the large energy companies should, quite frankly, know better uh, than to perform like that. And I think sometimes uh, both them and the large financial institutions, the banks, I think should be held to account with the way they treat. I mean, take, for instance, just recently, of course, they, we had the change in interest rates and they haven't passed it on to the, the end user. So what are they doing? Like fuel companies. For instance, uh, your fuel company, is it holding on to your overpayment at the moment? There are a few fuel companies out there that will actually pay you interest on the overspend or the over amount of money that's in your account um, while it's sitting there, which I think is a fantastic idea. Probably, in fact, slightly more than the banks will at the moment. But there are some, there are some organisations that what they're doing, uh, they will hold on to your overpayment until you ask for it. And what are they doing with it? They're investing it and they're doing all sorts of things and 
getting interested. I think it's de deplorable, quite frankly. And large multinationals and the banking institutions, they need to remember who the customer actually is. Right, I really will get down off my soapbox now. So there we are. Uh, it's quite, it's a very high soapbox, by the way. Uh, effective marketing in a digital world. If you go back and you dig out Business Connections Live 186, it was a cracking program. That was on the 2nd of July, 2017, on this edition of Business Connections Live. I was talking to Grant LeBoff. He is one of the UK's leading sales and marketing experts. And we were talking about effective marketing in a digital world. Great show. If you think about the World Wide Web and the, well, the whole digital technology that's out there, it really has changed the way that we live and we work and also the way we communicate with each other. That's shown simply by the fact that GDPR is about uh, because of those changes that's coming in. And that has been a profound effect on how companies uh, now go about marketing themselves to other successful organisations in today's business environment. Just to give you some of the hints and tips that uh, Grant came up with, here's what happened on that edition of Business Connections Live. Yeah, so I'm Grant Lieboff from Sticky Marketing Club. And what I would say is understand today as a business owner, you own media channels, your website, your blog, your YouTube, your Facebook, your LinkedIn. And that means you have to create great content because that's the currency of media. And the, and the opportunity for you is to build an audience, to build an audience and retain that audience with that content. So when they're ready to buy, you are front of mind and you get a seat at the table. And that's what marketing is all about, is to create opportunities for your business so you can sell and be successful. That was a really good show. He really knows his onions and his bacon as well. A fantastic program. Grant LaBeouf there on Business Connections Live. If you get a chance, Business Connections Live 186. Uh, we broadcast on the 2nd of July 2017, earlier on in the year. Effective marketing in the digital world. If you go onto the website, Business Connections Live, as I said, there's over 250 hours of great business advice and information. And if you put into the search bar at the top of the page, effective marketing in the digital world or just digital world, it'll find that program for you and it'll be fantastic and you'll really enjoy getting the information that uh, is in that show out to you. You're watching Business Connections Live. My guest in today's studio is in today's studio. My guest in today's program is in today's studio. Why well, it's, it's every day studio actually is Linda Bazant, GDPR lawyer and consultant. We're talking about all things GDPR. If you're just joining us, thank you very much indeed, and welcome along to the program. You're a little bit late, but we'll take notes uh, later on from you with your excuses. Uh, let's continue where we were with emails. We've talked, for those that are late, we've talked about telephony, nuisance calls. We've also talked about buying lists. We've kind of started talking about email spam. And email spam really is a nightmare of so many people. Um, what, what other things can you tell us about email spam? I mean, w when I receive an email, I do expect to be able to unsubscribe. Now, many people would say, once you press the unsubscribe button, A, you're confirming that it is an active and live email. Yes. And many times when you unsubscribe, you don't unsubscribe. You just receive more. So what's your advice? Every email that you send out for marketing purposes, or any purposes really, should have an unsubscribe button at the bottom. And yes, you're right, sometimes when you click on them, you are purely confirming your email address. But once again, come May, if you continue to get mail from these people when you've already told them that you want to unsubscribe, the fines will be huge. So if they are repeat offenders, Again, Information Commissioner's Office, and they will investigate them and they will be fined appropriately. So you should find that spam emails will reduce over the next year or so because of the new fines that will be introduced in May. Don't you think, though, there is an issue here where, for instance, if I said to you, you must not rob a bank. If you rob a bank, we will put you in jail. So there's your fine. So there's do not do this action. And if you do do this action, we'll put you in jail. People still rob banks. They still get put in jail. What, what can we do to stop the illegal spam spammers? Is it a case of that all we can do is reduce, but we'll never, ever eliminate it? I don't think you will ever eliminate it, but I think that there should be a huge reduction after next May, especially with companies that the Information Commissioner's Office are aware of. So, for example, um, spam emails 9th of October, 
company fined £50,000 for sending 1.26 million spam emails promoting products and services as far-ranging as dog food, wine, competitions and boilers on behalf of other firms. I but thought they, you were going to say a well known energy company there. I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> I know I'd start you off again. Uh, but they didn't have the right consent needed from those people to even send those emails. So, they've been, so they're being fined right now. Uh, emails to customers who asked not to be contacted because they'd asked to be unsubscribed. Price comparison website Money Supermarket in July fined £80,000 for sending millions of emails to customers who'd made it clear that they did not want to be contacted. So it's already happening. So if companies like that continue to do this, you may be looking at the fines and thinking, well, moneysupermarket.com, £80,000, pocket money. Might be then. Come May, it won't be. What about if I'm running a company at the moment? What are the, the rule of thumb that I should be doing when it comes to my email marketing? So take, for instance, I, I do some prospecting and I go on to LinkedIn and I get all my names on LinkedIn. And from what I understand, from what I've read, if somebody responds to me on LinkedIn, that is, you can tell me I'm wrong now, aren't you? That, that is confirmation that they accept that I will, that I will be in contact. It's, it's a business platform. It's a business website. So am I legitimately in a position where, what, could, could I take their email address from LinkedIn and put that in my own CRM system? No, they're not giving you permission for that. They are giving permission for you to talk to them on LinkedIn. And you have email on LinkedIn that you can contact them with. If they have accepted your link, that's fine, but culling their email information, unacceptable. So you can't take the inf excuse me, just one second. Uh, you can't take the information that you collect on. That's not what they're giving you permission for. So they're giving you permission to do what with it? They're giving you permission to talk to them on LinkedIn. If you have an email with somebody and you, you talk to them about your business, say thank you for linking in with me, by the way, this is what I do. Um, if you'd like more information, I'm, I'm happy to contact you. And they come back to you and say, that would be great. Here's my email address, send me some more information. You've got their unambiguous consent. But their, but their email address is available on LinkedIn. So once they link in with you, you have that information. So therefore, surely... I'm just asking that they've put it into the into the domain. I will get told off for this later. They will they've put it into a domain where it can actually be accessed. So it's a business platform. Yes. They've accepted your invitation. Yes. Their email and contact information is all on there. Yes. Um, but it, for, that you, for you to contact them for business purposes in as much as, here's my email address. If you'd like to know more about what I do, please contact me on my email. And here it is. Not, please mark it to me. That's not what they're saying. Because there, there are people on there that what they'll say is, well, thank you very much for linking in with me or, or accepting my invitation. Uh, um, for convenience, what I have done, I've now put you on my mailing list and I, uh, so they're now in there, so they've taken them off the platform. And I know that both LinkedIn and also Facebook try to stop you leaving the platform. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, with Facebook, if you've got any form of business registration form, when it opens, it will open within Facebook and the registration mechanics, the, the software behind collecting the names doesn't work while you're in f um, Facebook. Right. You've got to open it in a browser. To, to allow you to do that. So you, what you're saying is what's in the platform stays in the platform. It should stay in the platform. And you, you've, wow, got in, the, you've got in-mail. There's no reason why you can't contact people that contact you to say, I'd like to send you some more information about my business. Is there another contact address that I can send? Can well, I you've email got that, something? Though. Yeah, but not for marketing. You are going to hit me in a moment, aren't you? Um, all right, then. So let, let's, let's move on just a, a little bit from that, then. So. Uh, we, we can't do that. What should we be doing when we're sending out our emails? There, there are a number of people now that if you're using a CRM system, it automatically puts an unsubscribe yes. at the bottom of it. Sometimes it can be a bit clunky that you, it takes you somewhere and you've got to put in your email address again, da 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 da, da to, be, to unsubscribe. Uh, some, of, some of them will just unsubscribe or some of them say respond with the word unsubscribe no, you... what what do you have to be able, what to be within the letter of the law now 
What do you need to do? From May, it should be very, very easy to unsubscribe. You shouldn't have to be jumping through hoops. You should be able to unsubscribe very, very easily by just clicking that button that says unsubscribe. What else should we be considering as well when it comes to GDPR and the content of our emails? We've now got a whopping huge unsubscribe go away button on our website or, or on our emails. What else should be on there? What, what by law should our emails be carrying? Who you are and how to contact you. There should always be who your company is and a telephone number or, or an email address that says this is how you can contact us if you've got a problem. Right. Where to next then? So that's emails. What, what else then? What is the next area that we should be looking at? Uh, well, text. Ah, oh, now text. Now, this, oh. is the, this is the brand new thing, isn't it? Uh, along with automated IVR systems that are phoning you up and giving you some funny old information, text messaging. Now, of course, this is the, the new panacea when it comes to all things to be resolved for advertisers. They feel that they know where your phone is. If you're in a particular area, they can see your, you're in the particular area and they can start communicating with personalised targeted advertising, which will be to your benefit. That's why we're sending you the text. Yes. That's not going to be the case, is it? I can feel it in my bones that it's all going to go horribly wrong for this technology. Well, already, uh, <laughs> in May this year, Greater Manchester used car dealer, sent hundreds of thousands of spam texts, fined £40,000. A fair and firm... How much? £40,000. £40,000. A fair and firm £100,000 fine for sending millions of spam texts about mobile phone upgrades. Right. So, People are being fined for this, and I, I know it's a problem because I. In, this is time for me to get on my soapbox. All right. Oh, wow. Uh, some of the texts that you get do say, if you don't want to receive any more texts, text stop to this number. Celebrity cruises, people. The number of texts that I've had from them, and I have sent back to them saying stop. I am going to complain to the Information Commissioner's Office. So the next fine that you see might well be celebrity cruises. Stop texting people when they say stop. Let's just get that one more time. Celebrity cruises then. I didn't, didn't realise you were indeed a celebrity. But I, I'm <laughs> sure that you'll be, you'll be very good on the, on the ship. But that is interesting. And I, th and I think it's because when we talk about these fines, First of all, you've brought to to my attention a number of the fines that are there. They, they don't seem horrendously big. They don't seem to be as big a deterrent as I would have liked them to be. Well, they have a limit of five hundred thousand but... pounds for serious breach, and of course, seventeen million it goes up to in May. And do and but they're not going to do that surely on the first. I mean, a, a, a little Mickey Mouse company like should we say like ours, for instance, or something like that. I mean, they're they're not going to come in here and bankrupt the company, are they? If you continuously breach then yes, because you shouldn't even be in business. The, the answer is yes, then. Not this company. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're squeaky clean. <laughs> um, but, but if you continue to just fly in the face of the Information Commissioner's Office, when they've said to you, stop doing it, they find you and then you do it again. The next time, yes, they can wipe you out. All right, listen, we've got more from Linda. Still more to come, actually. Uh, we're going to be talking about call recording as well, are we? What, what other topics are we talking we, we'll, about? We'll talk about call recording, yes. And what? we also talked about, about B2B marketing. All right, then. So we've got a little bit of B2B marketing coming up in just a few moments. And, of course, I suppose that's what a majority of us SMEs are all about. I, I, it is. I, I hang my head in shame. Be, not even in shame, but just in sorrow. It is going to be really, really hard work, I think. I think it is going to make it difficult. But I think that I think the benefits out, outweigh the disadvantages. I think what we're, we're all going to see is we're going to see uh, more profitable personal lists that we have qualified and and, and quite frankly you know we we do live in this vanity of numbers saying the number of people that follow you on on linkedin the number of people that follow you on twitter uh, the number of people that view your video i mean quite frankly if somebody said that you know three people viewed your your video one of them was theresa may alan sugar and bill gates you'd be happy with three wouldn't you i would wouldn't you of course you would my guest on today's show is Linda Bazan, GDPR lawyer and consultant. Listen, thousands of you are downloading this program on a monthly basis on iTunes. We'd like to thank you very much for that. But you can help us out if you don't mind, because having just said it's all about numbers, numbers do help, though, at times, particularly in the world of iTunes. The program is predominantly viewed uh, across the world, in fact, uh, the UK, Europe, 
uh, America, China, surprisingly, and then Australasia. And we see those downloads and we get those analytics coming back, which is very, very interesting. But we'd like you to help us to grow that audience. We also go out in the US uh, on the Roku platform, which is, you know, huge, millions of people. It's one of the fastest growing um, direct-to-home delivery platforms that are out there, which, and we have our own channel on that. So once again, to all our American audience, thank you very much indeed for watching the business programs. You can actually see what is happening here in the UK when it comes to small to medium scale enterprises and businesses, particularly in the likes on today's program about GDPR. But if you are downloading the show and listening to it either as a podcast or after the program, just to really catch up or to listen again to the information that we give, uh, we'd love you to leave us a review on iTunes because it all helps. It will recommend the program on to other people who've got similar interests to you. It's dead easy to do. All you've got to do is log into your iTunes account, uh, find the program, view it in iTunes. You see all the shows there. You can download them all for free. Find the tab that says Ratings and Reviews. Click on that. Uh, that will then take you to the bit where you can actually write out your rated review. If you'd like to say... I uh, really enjoyed today's promo on GDPR. I thought Linda Bassan's jacket was rather good. Uh, I'd like to give Steve five stars. Uh, then you can go right ahead. Now, what will happen is that when somebody else is watching uh, a similar kind of program, the analytics uh, that are on iTunes will uh, then recommend our program onto them and they will watch our program as well, which would be fantastic. So if you can do that, help us grow the name Business Connections Live as a trusted business resource around the world, we would really appreciate it. So thank you very much indeed. You're watching Business Connections Live. Joining me in the studio today is Linda Bazant, GDPR lawyer and consultant. And we're going to be talking about what now? B2B business. B2B, B2B marketing, B2B contacting, B2B. Uh, B2C uh, obviously is business to customer, B2B is business to business. What do we need to take into account when we're doing B2B marketing? What you need to take into account is that in B2B marketing, you are usually emailing or phoning businesses and you've got a business email address. So all the rules are different then? No, not entirely, I'm afraid, sorry. Um, but with B2B emailing, for example, I may be contacting you and I'll have your name in the email, but Business Connections Live. Now, I can still do that, but I've got to have the option on the email to say that you may Remo uh, you, you may be removed, you may be suppressed, so that I don't get I may be removed. Again, well, Wishful thinking. <laughs> I'm sure British Gas would like to remove you. Um, however, <laughs> um, so you can, you can still contact your, your business contacts that you've already got. Uh, be careful again with lists, though, because you're still in the area possibly of in individual personal details. But generally speaking, dis business to business is okay, and we expect to, to hear from other businesses. But um, you, you must, again, it's very important that you have the unsubscribe button, but you also give your full details of who you are and how to contact you to any people that you're contacting B2B. That does sound nearly contradictory to what we were saying with LinkedIn. Nearly. In as much as that LinkedIn, I, have all, that I see LinkedIn as a business platform, and therefore we're using LinkedIn really in, in, a, in a B2B effort. Are you saying that, that, that LinkedIn, even though perceived as a business platform, is still personal? But the thing is, with LinkedIn, of course, you're linking in with people. You're linking in with individual people on LinkedIn. Right. And again, as I said, you can use email to say, very interesting, I'd like to contact you. Can I have your permission? OK, so once again, we've got to be very clear on what we're doing there. We've got to make absolutely certain that we are completely covered when it comes to, to B2B. Unsubscribe, contact details have all got to be on the email. But phone calls, now this is really important with phone calls. If you are making calls and you, and you, you phone your, your business to business people on a regular basis, that's fine. But when they say to you, I want you to stop calling me, You've got to stop calling them. You cannot put in the proviso of, oh, if you want us to stop calling you, can you write to this address? No. Can you email us? No. If they say to you on the phone, I don't want to hear from you again, that's it. It stops immediately. Where's the proof of that then? Well, that's the problem, isn't it? I and mean, the, the customer or, or the business can come to you and say, I spoke to whoever. I mean, if you're on the end of, receiving end of a call and you actually want to stop it, you need to know who you're talking to. So again, 
can I have your name? And the name of your Click. business. Brrr. Yeah, and that's a problem. And that is the problem. That's isn't a it? problem. But if you've got the telephone number, again, you complain to the information commissioner's office. Do, but, do but on business to business, it's not, it's not, it's not quite like so prevalent. That. Do, do, do you think that there will be a positive effect to business to business marketing from GDPR, or do you think it will become sales prevention? I don't think it will become sales prevention. Uh, one of the, th the things that I say when I go out and speak to people is I ask people in the room, how many of you have a customer database? And so many people put up their hands. And then I say to them, how many of the people on your customer database are customers? And hands go down. Because they think that because they've got a database of people's names, they're their customers. They're not your customers. They're people that you would possibly like to be your customers, but if they are saying to you, leave me alone, I don't want to hear from you, why are you wasting your sales effort on people that don't want to hear from you? Concentrate on the people that do. Hone down your list because it's better for you. And these people are saying, by, by saying to you, yes, I'd like you to contact me, we trust you. And there's an element of trust in this as well. And GDPR is trying to engender trust because I said right at the beginning, people are saying they do not trust people that collect their data. What about contact details of individuals and businesses that are to all intents and purposes in the public domain? So if I was to go on the onto any website now, I would probably find a lot of contact details. Uh, I, I mentioned to you earlier on the word, you know, scraping websites. There are people out there mm. that will scrape websites, but that content is in the public domain. It's in the public domain for you to call them and say, I'm interested in your product. Not for you to call them and start marketing to them and selling to them. So do we have, as business owners, do we have to have some form of proviso on our website? This information yes. is on this site so to allow you to contact us if you wish to purchase. In your privacy statement, yes, you can say that. Um, that it, it may well be that on your website you collect people's data on the forms and so mm -hmm. on, and you need to have something on there to say, we would like to send you marketing information. Tick this box if, if you are giving us permission oh, to no, do no. that. Oh, no, no, you want the box that says, untick this box no. if... You can't do that no, either now. You can't, no. The box has got to be a box that says, I want you to market to me. I knew that, I'm, by I'm the way. I was just leading you, you on. Yeah. I know so, you right. Okay. So, so you, it's got to be proactive. It's got to be unambiguous. It, it can't be misconstrued. Um, we also spoke earlier about telephone calls, recorded messages. Yes. This, this call will be recorded for training purposes and whatever. You will find that that will change in as much as if anybody wants to record the call, they have to say to you before they start recording anything, we would like to record this call for training purposes. Do we have your consent to do that? And if you say no, they may not record the call. Wow. I know what I'll be doing in the future. The only, the only way that that would be different is if you are talking to a financial institution, Dang an no, insurance no, no, no. company, uh, you've got to be careful because they have to, legally, they have to record the call to say what they'd offered to you as a financial instrument perhaps, that's different. But there are some companies that you'll phone up and there's absolutely no reason for them to record the call whatsoever. So just be very uh, be very aware of that if you are going down the route of calls being recorded, you know, you. you if, if you're already using that right now, a lot of people, particularly for training, um, we're recording this call for um, training purposes. When I train people, I charge them. I object to that. Can I object to that legitimately? So if I'm training people and they are just taking it for free, it's a bit like when people phone up and say, we'd like uh, to ask you a few questions for a survey. I always say, I charge for that information because I'm just a bit awkward like that. So, I mean, I, am I, do I have the legitimate right to turn around and say, I don't, I, for training purposes, I don't want to be recorded. For the financial yes. stuff, yes. But I do not want this information or content used in any form of training within your organisation. Yes, but they must tell you that before they start recording anything. 
So they right. can't start recording and then say, oh, this call has been recorded for training purposes. Is that OK? Because no, it shouldn't have been recorded in the first place without your consent. Do you think we'll start hearing a lot more messages now at the beginning of every phone call that we have where they say this call has been recorded? Because there are organisations out there that record every phone call, don't they? They record everything. Yes, but they can only record it if they really need to. They've got really? to have a, a, a good business reason for doing it. Otherwise, they've got to have your unambiguous consent. Listen, we're, we're nearly at the end of the programme. It's been a fascinating insight. I think the trouble with GDPR, you could, you could talk for hours. There are so many different um, aspects of it that you need to explore and go down the avenues of and see exactly how it's going to affect your business. If I was to say to you, what would be your advice to a company? Would it be be afraid, very afraid, extremely afraid? How would you scale it? Or is it a case of be approach GDPR with um, an objective but co with a common sense view? I don't have to say that. You just said it for me. There you go. That's what she would say. Thank <laughs> you. She's, she's playing the game. Listen, we're, we're nearly out of time, Lynn. Um, if you don't mind, if you could just give us the key takeaways that we need to remember when it comes to what we're talking about, please straight down camera number four, who you are, where you're from, and then we'll go from there. The airways are all yours. Linda Bazant lawyer and GDPR consultant and really with regard to GDPR the general data protection regulation which comes into force on the 25th of May 2018 as I said before you've already got data protection and what you need to do now is look at what the new rules and regulations are going to be check the rules and regulations that you've already got in your policies and make sure that you have updated them and most importantly train your staff to understand GDPR. GDPR will become the same as health and safety. Your staff must live, eat and breathe GDPR in the same way that they live, eat and breathe health and safety. So make sure that everybody knows exactly what is expected of them and how to respond to anything that comes through on emails, phones, texts, websites. And just make absolutely certain that you look at your lists Look at your list, make sure that they are bona fide lists. And remember that people need to trust you. And the more people that trust you, the more they will actually want to remain your customers and you'll have a much better business. Thank you very much, Linda Bazan there, and a, a really interesting insight. If you want to find out more about Linda and uh, GDPR in general, you can go to her website at lindabazant.co.uk or lindabazant.com, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, lindabazant.com. Sorry, lindabazant. I think you've got both, haven't you? Got lindabazant.com. Lindabazant.com. And um, if you work your way down the page, you can find out the different services that Linda offers. You can see a little bit from one of her presentations. She does a number of keynotes, uh, talks around the UK. If you'd like to invite Linda to maybe come along to your organisation and to give a presentation to your senior management team or whatever uh, about GDPR and what the influences are and what, the, what it actually means to you, then please do uh, watch that and you'll find out more. Also on her particular page as well, you'll see that there is a form there. Now, that behind that form, if you fill that in, you will not be hit by spam email, but you've got a 16-part kind of reminder of the key things that you need to remember when it comes to GDPR. Is a that set right? Of, a set of 16 videos on different areas of GDPR. All right, just so give, if you fill, it just gives information. So if you fill that form in, it'll take you to those particular videos and that'll be fantastic. All right, so, you know, once again, just really interesting. So I hope you found this uh, programme on GDPR a fascinating insight into what you should expect when it comes to the general data protection regulation and why you should be aware of what it means to you and to your business. And that probably wraps up this edition of the program. My thanks to Linda Bazant. My thanks to you as well for watching today's program. On our next program, we're going to be talking to Louise Punter, the CEO of the Surrey Chamber of Commerce. We're going to be talking about the budget. That's just around the corner. She's going to be joining me here in the studio. Uh, coming up in the future programs, we've got Penny Power, OBE. She's going to be talking here about crowdfunding. Stuart Miller from Warwick Legal uh, is going to be joining me in the studio as well, telling us about the implications of Brexit and Sylvia Bulldog. A speaker and trainer talking about style and image. Till we do it all again next week from all the team here at Business Connections Live. Bye for now. Bye bye.